Today, uh, we're talking about unproductive labour. Capitalist economics confuses making money with real production. As a result, there's lots of activities which actually produce nothing or may make society poorer, but they're con counted as, as, as if they contribute to the economy. Some examples of this are the gambling industry, the armaments industry, insurance, banking, the so-called sex industry. Neoliberal economics take the position that any private business is productive and any public activity funded out of taxation is unproductive. But this is a terrible step back from classical political economy which had a clear distinction between them. Adam Smith was a moral philosopher living in Glasgow in the 18th century. He gave two criteria for something to be productive. The first was that the work must produce a vendable physical commodity that exists independently of the worker themselves. And the second is that the worker must be employed out of capital and not revenue. Both these conditions must apply for work to be productive. Let's see what this implies. What is a vendable physical commodity? Well, a farmer growing corn, spinsters making thread, workers in a coal mine, all produced vendable physical commodities. Things which he said were not production of physical commodities was an advocate speaking in court, an actor on the stage, a musician giving a live performance, because of course live performances were the only performances there were in those days. In Smith's view, services were not productive. He said, that work consists in services which perish generally in the very instant of their performance and does not fix or rely, realize itself in any vendable commodity which can replace the value of their wages and maintenance. Why is he making this fuss about productive labour? It's because he's concerned with accumulation. His greatest book, or his most famous book, was The Wealth of Nations. He was concerned with accumulation, which was necessary to grow the wealth of nations. Thus for him, productive labour is that labour which produces a surplus value, which can potentially be accumulated to boost future production. The distinction between productive and unproductive labour is continued in the Marxist tradition and Marx says that productive labour produces surplus value. Productive labour, in its meaning for capitalist production, is wage labour which, exchanged against the variable part of capital, reproduces not only this part of capital but in addition produces surplus value for the capitalist. As we'll see later, it's not always that easy to see which labour produces surplus value. Now, Smith emphasised the need for productive labour to produce a persistent vendable commodity. Why is this persistence important? The reason is that only persisting commodities can lead to the accumulation of capital. Capital accumulation always requires some material substance. This is either food and consumer goods needed to support a larger working population, or a quantity of machinery, raw materials, etc. to expand production. Society cannot accumulate lawyer speeches or live songs to expand future performance. Now, that of course changes once recording technology was developed. Musicians could start to be productive workers. A singer in a recording studio leaves a permanent record, which becomes part of the capital stock of the re record company. The digital recording becomes a means of production of CDs, and the recording thus becomes part of the constant capital of the firm. Smith's other point 
was that productive labour exchanges against capital and unproductive labour exchanges against revenue. Generally, this was against the revenue of the upper classes, the capitalists, the lords or the state. An example of an unproductive labourer who exchanged against revenue would be a butler of a duke, the queen's soldiers, priests of the church. Now, none of these are actually producing anything, but they also exchange against revenue. But the, the, the duke's cook may produce a meal, but it doesn't, she doesn't produce a commodity. She exchanges against revenue and the commodities consume the, the output is not a commodity, it's consumed as a use value. So these servants neither produce vendable commodities, nor do they exchange against capital. There are harder cases though. Consider these two 19th century ships. The one on the left was built in the Royal Dockyard. The one on the right was built at Thompson's and the Clyde. Now, which dockyard workers were productive? The ones on the left, the ones on the right, both of them, or neither of them? It's clear that in both cases, the dockyard workers produced a persisting object, a ship. But which of these was productive labour? Now, at one level, it's clear that war is never productive or at least it's never productive of use value, it's destructive. Sailors in the Navy are unproductive both because they don't produce any use values and because they exchange against tax, their labour exchanges against tax revenue. So it also follows that the workers in the Royal Dockyards at Portsmouth paid for out of, Navy, out of the Navy budget employed by the Admiralty, were employed out of re revenue, and had to be unproductive labour. On the other hand, J. N. G. Thompson on the Clyde was a private firm. So the workers' labour power there exchanged directly against capital. Did this make them productive? On the other hand, the ship they built, the Terrible, was paid for out of tax revenue too. So. Indirectly, their labour exchanged against revenue, should it count as productive. Why could Thompson's on the Clyde actually make a profit under those circumstances? There seemed to be two ways it could do it. Either it was more efficient than the state yards, or it gouged the, state, the taxpayer because no state yard could build such a ship. But we know, in fact, that the first option was false. An examination of the accounts of the Clyde Yards shows that they barely broke even when competing against the State Yards and in general the State Yards were more efficient. When they had to compete against State production they could only break even. Nowadays this doesn't happen. The state yards have been sold off and the BAE works at Govan has no state competitor so it can freely overcharge. But suppose Thompson had overcharged for a new warship. Did that profit come out of the surplus value created by workers in Clyde Bank? Not really. It would just have been a redistribution of already existing surplus. Armaments are paid for out of the surplus of the rest of the economy. So Thompson's profit would just have been a deduction from the profit of the rest of the bourgeoisie. Hence, in the 19th century, the Liberals, who were the party of the industrial bourgeoisie, were against heavy spending on armaments. Gladstone emphasised that it was unproductive. Now, there is a more sophisticated way to demonstrate this, and this involves understanding Marx's reproduction schemes, which show the functional dependencies between different parts of the economy. He set up tables 
with rules that had to hold if the economy was to reproduce. I have created an online version of Marx's reproduction schemes using Google Sheets. And you can use this to demonstrate that relative surplus value cannot be created in the luxury goods or armaments sector. My next video will be a tutorial on how to use these interactive reproduction schemes.